The Alamo. 13 days to a republic. Sponsored in part by TXTraders.com. Remember the Alamo, day 13 of the siege. The Alamo has fallen. In remembrance of those who fought so bravely and paid the ultimate sacrifice. Midnight, March 5, 1836. Santa Ana's troops began to mobilize, silently moving toward their places to await the start of the battle. Despite the orders to forego overcoats, cloaks, and blankets, the men were instructed to lay on their stomachs on the cold, damp grass. For several hours, the soldiers lay on the ground in complete darkness. Although the original orders gave the battle starting time as 4 a.m., the soldiers were not completely in place until about 5 a.m. Some were stationed within 300 feet of the Alamo. At 5.30 a.m., Santa Ana gave the order to begin the assault. The excited troops began shouting, Viva Santa Ana! Viva la Republica! The Texian sentries were surprised and killed quickly before they could raise an alarm. The shouting woke the Texians, but by the time they reached their posts, the Mexican soldiers were already within musket range. Inside the compound, Adjutant John Ball had just began his morning rounds when he heard the cries. He hurriedly ran to the quarters of Colonel William Barrett Travis. He awakened him with, Colonel Travis, the Mexicans are coming. Travis and his slave Joe quickly scrambled from their cots. The two men grabbed their weapons and headed for the North Wall Battery. Travis yelled, Come on, boys, the Mexicans are on us, and we'll give them hell. Unable to see the advancing troops for the darkness, the Texian gunners blindly opened fire. They had packed their cannons with jagged pieces of scrap metal, shot and chained. The muzzle flash briefly illuminated the landscape, and it was with horror that the Texians understood their predicament. The enemy had nearly reached the walls of the compound. The Mexican soldiers had immediate, terrible losses. The first cannon blast ripped a huge gap in their column. Colonel Jose Enrique de la Pina would later write, A single cannon volley did away with half the company of Chasseur from Toluca. The screams and moans of the dying and wounded only heightened the fear and chaos of those first few moments of the assault. Travis hastily climbed to the top of the North Wall Battery and readied himself to fire, discharging both barrels of his shotgun into the massed troops below. As he turned to reload, a single lead ball struck him in the forehead, sending him rolling down the ramp where he came to rest in a sitting position. Travis was dead. Joe saw his master go down and so retreated to one of the rooms along the west wall to hide. There was no safe position on the walls of the compound. Each time the Texian riflemen fired at the troops below, they exposed themselves to deadly Mexican fire. On the south end of the compound, Colonel Juan Morales and about 100 riflemen attacked what they perceived was the weak palisade area. They met heavy fire from Crockett's riflemen and a single camp. Morales' men quickly moved toward the southwest corner, and the comparative safety was covered behind an old stone building and the burned ruins of scattered jacobs. On the north wall, exploding Texian canisters shredded but did not halt the advance of Mexican soldiers. Casas and Duque's companies, now greatly reduced in number, found themselves at the base of the north wall. Romero's men joined them after his column had wheeled to the right to avoid deadly grape shot from the guns of the Alamo Church. General Castrillion took command from the wounded Colonel Duque and began the difficult task of getting his men over the wall. As the Mexican army re reached the walls, their advance halted. Santa Ana saw this lag and so committed his reserve of 400 men to the assault, bringing the total force to around 1,400 men. Amid the Texian cannon fire tearing through their ranks, General Cosa's troops performed a right oblique to begin an assault on the west wall. The Mexicans used axes and crowbars to break through the barricaded windows and openings. They climbed through the gun ports and over the wall to enter the compound. 
General Amador and his men entered the compound by climbing up the rough-faced repairs made on the north wall by the Texians. They successfully breached the wall, and in a flood of fury the Mexican army poured through. The Texians turned their cannon northward to check this new onslaught. With cannon fire shifted, Colonel Morales recognized a momentary advantage. His men stormed the walls and took the southwest corner, the 18-pounder, and the main gate. The Mexican army was now able to enter from almost every direction. In one room near the main gate, the Mexican soldiers found Colonel James Bowie. Bowie was critically ill and confined to a bed when the fighting began. The soldiers showed little mercy as they silenced him with their bayonets. The Texians continued to pour gunfire into the advancing Mexican soldiers, devastating their ranks. Still they came. When they saw the enemy rush into the compound from all sides, the Texians fell back to their defenses in the long barracks. Crockett's men in the Palisade area retreated into the church. The rooms of the North Barrack and the Long Barracks had been prepared well in advance in the event the Mexicans gained entry. The Texians made the rooms formidable by trenching and barricading them with raw cowhides filled with earth. For a short time, the Texians held their ground. The Mexicans turned the abandoned Texian cannon on the barricaded rooms. With cannon blast followed by a musket volley, the Mexican soldiers stormed the rooms to finish the defenders inside the barrack. Mexican soldiers rushed the darkened rooms. With sword, bayonet, knife, and fist, the adversaries clashed. In the darkened rooms of the North Barrack, it was hard to tell friend from foe. The Mexicans systematically took room after room. Finally, the only resistance came from within the church itself. Once more, the Mexicans employed the Texians' cannon to blast apart the defenses of the entrance. Bonham, Dickinson, and Esparza died by their cannon at the rear of the church. An act of war became a slaughter. It was over in minutes. By 6.30 a.m., the Alamo had fallen. According to one of Santa Ana's officers, the Mexican army overwhelmed and captured a small group of defenders. According to this officer, Crockett was among them. The prisoners were brought before Santa Ana, where General Castrillon asked for mercy on their behalf. Santa Ana instead answered with a gesture of indignation and ordered their execution. Nearby officers, who had not taken part in the assault, fell upon the helpless men with their swords. One Mexican officer noted in his journal that, though tortured before they were killed, these unfortunates died without complaining and without humiliating themselves before their torturers. Santa Ana ordered Alcalde Francisco Ruiz to gather firewood from the surrounding countryside, and in alternating layers of wood and bodies, the dead were stacked. At five o'clock in the evening, Fires were lit. In this final act, Santa Ana's small affair ended. Thanks so much for tuning in each day as we journeyed back in time and studied the valor of the events that surrounded the Battle of the Alamo. Joel Johnson here, American Crossroads Radio founder and program director. So glad that uh, you've tuned in for this special look at uh, something that defines Texas history. You know, most might think my thoughts are archaic in this matter, but just be mistaken. As I was visiting the research and postings on the details surrounding the 13-day siege, I found my respect for the souls that left it all on the soil of that old mission for the sake of true personal liberty for their sons and daughters continually deepen in honor and remembrance of the supreme price that was paid for the freedoms that I enjoy today. I was blessed to have been born a native Texan. I say blessed not in a condescending text, but in a context of heavy responsibility to never squander the sacrifice of better men than I. I spent my junior high years at Mance Park Junior High. The school sits right across the street 
from General Sam Houston's grave, and I actually had recess in the shadow of that grave. But even then, I, I didn't grasp his connection to my freedoms. Today, I cannot help but think of the individuals that fought in that epic battle. Think about it a moment. It was the 1800s. Their daily lives consisted of hard work and gathering food for their family daily. There was no quick trip to the store for the day's needs. Life was hard. To have the resolve to journey miles and miles by foot or horseback through wind, rain, cold, scorching sun, leaving their family behind to fend for themselves knowing the risks that lay ahead and the hardships that they were imposing on their family and what they would have to endure. And it couldn't have been easy. I feel sure that these were men of very, very few words. They were men of virtue and integrity. I find myself introspective this day, 180 years later. The similar weather pattern, the landscape of Central Texas where I call home, and studying the stories of the struggles seem to add to my thoughts. See, I'm a vocal proponent of freedom and true liberty in social media arenas and even in daily life, but I hold not a candle to those men. I would dare say that with all the bravado that we see from all sides, there exist very few of us that could have stood with the brave men that forsook it all for the sake of the next generation. They were most likely men of few words. They only knew action. So today, regardless of your political leanings, I would ask you humbly to join me in the reflection of their sacrifice for our freedoms. God help us all to continually be men and women, not of words filled with false bravado, but of people that employ rational and prudent action toward protecting and ensuring the natural laws of personal liberty for each individual. To never squander your blessings, Lord, that have been fought for and passed to us all by those that have gone before. Through apathy, petty political differences, let us never forget. Thanks for tuning in, folks. And stay with us as we celebrate the music and stories that are woven through the fabric of our lives. American Crossroads Radio.